visuals in this one, and I'm going to try to simplify the explanation of the methods. Um, I'm talking about um, a, a network science here, and uh, I'm talking about a project that's largely been led by my colleague Adam Dunn. He's a compu academic, academic computational scientist at Macquarie University. He's pictured on the right uh, there with another couple of colleagues, Kerry Wiley and um, Mareka Steffens. So uh, I particularly want to acknowledge Adam here and Didi Surian as well. Um, so we know, first of all, that uh, geographic networks influence sentiment about vaccination and they reflect sentiment. And we can see that with this map of uh, Australia, which uh, shows in darker colours the regions with higher rates of vaccine objection. Uh, similarly, in the US, and this is a, um, from Saad's work, this is uh, Michigan, looking at both um, exemption clusters um, mapped to um, pertussis clusters. So, you know, geographic networks influence um, and reflect uh, both sentiment and diseases. But what about online networks? What's going on there? Um, and, and just to sort of segue into our study, the world that we knew was uh, a, a slightly more linear one with respect to news production. Uh, so we had the uh, event, the um, generation of the news story, the publication and research may or may not have fed into that. But today we have an event that may be observed or experienced and then you have uh, observers or, or people who tweet about their own experience to their networks and they tweet to their networks and so forth. And, uh, and, and so because we're interested in kind of what impact that has on vaccination behaviour, we can do things. We can do a few things with Twitter, which is uh, you know, good because you can, it's, pub it's more publicly available than, say, Facebook. Um, you can access... Um, tweets and you can count them. So each of the lines here represents a Sunday. Um, these are tweets about HPV vaccination, 30,000 of them. And the, uh, the sort of the greeny blue colour is positive or neutral and the orange is negative. So if you want to get into the, the noise, you should be tweeting on a Tuesday. Um, but Counting tweets won't tell you about reach. And here's one reason why. I just grabbed this this morning. I've blacked out the, the Twitter handle. But this is a person who um, said something about Gardasil vaccination on Twitter a couple of days ago. And they've said this critical thing, but they've only got 55 followers. So they may be tweeting, but it's not reaching many people. And even then, their tweet might be a drop in the ocean of information that we're receiving as recipients of that tweet. And this is another reason why um, counting tweets doesn't tell you about reach, because this uh, graph shows that um, most of those people, so like that account that I showed you, which only has the 55 followers, um, they're the people who tend to tweet a lot and they're more likely to tweet a lot about vaccination. Whereas the people who have up to 5 million um, or hundreds of thousands of followers, they're uh, um, not tweeting as much about vaccination, HPV vaccination in this instance. And the orange line is the negative and the um, green line is the positive. And that same study um, was, was actually trying to overcome this issue by measuring exposure to tweets and looking at how exposure to tweets clusters within certain communities. So these um, circles, each, to each dot here represents a, a handle in Twitter, so an individual or an organisation, and the larger ones have more followers. So uh, here you can see that the negative tend to cluster together and the positive or neutral cluster together and there's not a huge amount of overlap. And uh, that shows visually that echo chamber effect or the filter bubble that, we, that people talk about. So measuring exposure um, is uh, one option to look at 
message reach. But looking at reach won't allow you, won't tell you what the impact is. And I think, um, you know, we see a lot of these claims in the media or even by commentators in our own field that um, there's all this stuff out there on the internet and it's influencing people to not vaccinate. Uh, we, need, we need data on this. We need to ba uh, base these claims on evidence. And uh, so often they're very monocausal assumptions about what's driving behaviour. So we are interested in the impact of social media and social networks on um, behaviour. However, um, we can't look at that. We can only look at associations with this research. So that's the caveat I'm putting here, that we'd love to look at a linear causal model, but that's not going to happen. We're just looking at associations, of which you'll see here. So our study was aimed at determining whether state-level differences in exposure to information on Twitter about HPV vaccines were associated with state-level differences in HPV vaccination coverage. And we chose, because we're Australians, we chose the US <laughs> to analyse our data. Um, so here am I, I'm qualitative, mostly I do qualitative research, um, which is probably not that different from big data analysis because you're using a lot of data to gain in, in, inferences iteratively. Um, but uh, uh, we, we, you know, we're, here I am talking about research um, that's been done by my colleagues largely on the US. So I feel like a few degrees of separation here, but um, we were aiming to do this. And the way we did that was that we were looking at state level coverage based on NIS data for 13 to 17 year, year olds um, for both 2014 and 2015 with the numbers of adolescents you see there, both males and females. Um, we were also looking at measures of poverty, racial and ethnic composition, insurance coverage and education from the census. And we also collected tweets in the period you see there using the um, terms that you see there. Um, and we ended up with uh, 258,000 tweets, um, which generated 273.8 million exposures. So, you know, that's the number of people being exposed to those tweets. Uh, and we classified all the the, the team classified the um, topics using machine learning methods, which I'll, um, I'll show you in a moment, uh, topic modelling. Um, and they compared the models with those based on insurance, income, education, race, ethnicity, and uh, also did location inference. So you can either um, look at the geotag. So here's my Twitter handle, and I've got the geotag there, Sydney, New South Wales. Um, and, you, and I've also said I'm, in, I'm based in Sydney, so that's the named in bio, and about 50% do that. And then it uses a gazetteer to try to estimate with various variables the location of the remainder who haven't declared those things. And here are the results. So this is just showing you the dis distribution of those exposures by county. So that's just a fairly descriptive look and showing you that there's, you know, there's d differences between counties in terms of exposure to tweets, regardless of whether they're negative, positive or neutral. And this is the, the topic modelling. So basically, the, a, a human doesn't do this. The machine looks at t the t all the tweets and looks at semantic clusters. So sort of theme clusters that emerge from the Twitter data and says there seem to be these or there are these distinct clusters and they look at it mathematically. And, and then a human comes along and looks at the word similarities and says, OK, I'm going to name this scandal and conspiracies. So that's how they do it. And what this showed was that in the red you have the more negative sentiment, the green is more positive sentiment, and there's this sort of um, uh, odd one, which is the experiences one, which uh, I'll show you in this um, cloud. At the bottom right, um, you've got you know tweets like, got my third HPV vaccine yesterday and my arm still hurts like a bitch. You know, it's these young people saying they had a rotten time getting the vaccine. Um, whereas the green um, is a more positive um, topic 
um, and that's around um, just sort of gen general positive statements about HPV vaccination, whereas the red is more critical. And these are just three of the topics among the, I think it was about 30 topics. Um, so what you also see here is like the, the other map, um, there is that distinct clustering. So the people who are negative tend to be near each other in the network. And same with the people who are positive. But what's interesting is the people who are talking about their experiences in the blue are diffused throughout the network. Um, and this also shows that if, uh, so the machine also can look at the clustering of communities. And uh, for example, one of the negative communities, community 24, um, had 5,275 users. They um, put out 2.46 tweets per user and those were related to harms and conspiracy. Whereas a bigger community with over 11,000 were putting out fewer tweets each and they were more around ev evidence and advocacy. Whereas community 34, which was about experience and they were, this particular group were actually connected to each other. Um, were only putting out just over one tweet per person. So that was that, oh God, I had the vaccine today or I'm going to get it today, I'm nervous, that kind of thing. One of the topics was the Katie Couric controversy. Um, I don't, uh, who, has have people heard of this? Um, some of you have. So typical sort of formula where a chat show host who has a big profile, in this case in the US, gets this sort of, expert on to make it look like there's dissent in the medical ranks around the safety of HPV vaccine. And uh, this caused a huge furor. Uh, she, she was subjected to a lot of criticism over entertaining these negative scare stories about um, HPV vaccination on her show. And what they did was they, uh, the team compared, that they correlated um, that topic, Katie Couric on the top in the purple, with coverage. So the red lines are coverage showing that for females, for example, for one dose, you have a negative correlation with state-based coverage. And uh, for green, that's a, a more sort of experiential um, topic. There's also a, a slightly negative correlation with coverage. Whereas um, this was interesting because this is another big news story. It was uh, Canada, the Toronto Star published this front page article about the wonder drugs dark side. And it had, um, you know, casting doubt on the safety of Gardasil. It had young women and, and compelling stories of young women who had allegedly, or whose parents claimed they'd been injured by HPV vaccine. And uh, they came under so much criticism. There was a very rapid response from the scientific community. There was a, they published an opinion piece. Um, and then the editor, um, you know, sort of basically retracted the article, recognising that it wasn't scientific in its claims. Um, and, and said what you see there, there was a bad story management. So that was associated with positive, um, the, the exposure to that, that topic, uh, and that's in the bottom graph, was associated with um, um, uptake. So it had a positive correlation. And what we think is happening there is simply that, you know, the people who are sort of being exposed to that message about the media mea culpa are the people who are positive about vaccination. So it's more reflective. This is really the, the, this is the last graphic, you'll be pleased to know. And this is the, um, the most important finding of the paper, which is that certainly if you look at, um, so for example, females receiving at least one dose, there, there's, um, if you use only Twitter, you can explain uh, just under 80% of the variance. Um, and that it explains uh, more of the variance than, say, insurance or poverty, insurance and poverty alone. Um, and uh, so it's essentially saying that this is quite either predictive or reflective or both, I think it's probably both, of vaccination uptake. 
So what does this all mean? But first of all, the caveat is that, as I said, we're not showing the direction of effect. We're not showing that, you know, because there's all this negative or positive information out there on Twitter, people are or aren't vaccinating. That's far too simple and we know that. Um, we, are, we are showing a correlation and a strong correlation though. We only used Twitter um, because of the availability, the more ready, ready availability of the information uh, and, you know, Facebook or other platforms, Instagram, WhatsApp would be equally, if not more, interesting to look at. Um, and it was uncorrected for differences in demographics between whom we measure and their population. So this is aggregate data. It's not individualised. Um, so, in, uh, you know, our conclusions are that in the US and with the HPV vaccine, um, measures of information exposure derived from Twitter explained differences in coverage, in, uh, in other words, were highly associated with them um, in a way that wasn't explained by socio-demographic factors. And that coverage was lower in states where safety concerns, misinformation and conspiracies made up a higher proportion of exposures. Coverage was mostly, uh, was closely correlated with topics that went into the mainstream media. Um, and I, I want to point out here that socioeconomic factors <laughs> remain significant. Uh, for example, with completion, three-dose completion for females, the um, correlation with insurance and poverty was 062 so that's still imp an important finding and I think we can't ignore the base rate there. Uh, and on Twitter and elsewhere, young people are uh, describing their HPV vaccination experiences. So what does this mean? Um, the efforts to continue to reduce socioeconomic barriers remain important. That Twitter sentiment is likely to both reflect and, and predict behaviour that Twitter data has the potential as a surrogate indicator for localised differences in acceptance. So, you know, if you've got a, a problem in a country and you lack the resources to get together um, a, a survey, um, this may be a way to rapidly look at sentiment, um, geographic distribution of it, and, uh, and also sort of the, uh, uh, what topics are arising in the public discourse. So there is the potential in this area, but it also requires, of course, capacity in people being able to do the work. Routine systems to monitor exposure could identify where misinformation is overrepresented and guide interventions. Um, and also that a young person's vaccination experience is important. Young people can lack knowledge, feel anxious and find pain of vaccination difficult. And there are strategies that are known that can assist them, um, such as those that have been looked at by my colleagues Rachel Skinner and Kristen Davies in Australia. <coughs> and our research is now focusing on um, machine learning of information quality. So we're going to teach the machine how to um, rate um, the quality of information circulated through t links circulated through Twitter and we're going to uh, correlate that with childhood vaccination coverage, sentiment and, and the quality. So um, that is funded by NHMRC and uh, we're sort of generating some hypotheses around that now. So if you're interested in having a chat about that later, I'd be very interested in doing so. Um, in closing, I just want to do a shameless plug for our fabulous network in Australia. We have a collaboration of social science and immunisation that we started about two years ago. It's sponsored by the National Centre for Immunisation Research. Um, and now uh, Margie Danchen, Top Wright and, and Holly, who you've just seen speak, are the co-chairs of that network. And this is a meeting we had in June with health professionals, policy people and researchers. So, Great things happening there down under in Australia. Thank you.